Hello and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction. I've been excited about this for a while. Today on the show, for the first time ever, we have not one, but two guests who have co-written an excellent book together. They're both currently researching nuclear fusion, and they've written a book about the future of fusion energy called, well, The Future of Fusion Energy. Dr. Justin Ball is currently studying plasma theory at Lausanne, and Jason Parisi works on turbulent transport in highly magnetised plasmas just a few buildings away from me here at the University of Oxford. Their book is an excellent guide to the science, history and future of fusion energy, and a real help in compiling the marathon run that the show has had so far, so I was excited to be able to grab both of them for an interview to talk about fusion. Since this comes after I've already been yakking about fusion for ages, the conversation does assume some knowledge of what nuclear fusion is, but should be easier to follow if you've listened to some of the episodes in this series already. Without further ado then, the first part of the interview. Okay, so... Hello, Justin and Jason. First of all, I want to congratulate you both on the future of fusion energy. It's a testament to how good the book is that I've been reading about fusion for a number of years, and I've scripted all these podcast episodes about it that my listeners are familiar with by now. Yet I still learned an awful lot from the book itself. You know, it's really clear, very amusing. I think any reader willing to give it a little bit of effort will end up with an excellent perspective on, you know, the history of fusion and also the science behind it. Um, So I hope, you know, you guys can carry on writing together like this and in similar subjects. And in particular, I... I got intrigued by the ending where we talked about fusion startups and alternative methods to getting to fusion, and that would almost make a worthy sequel. I know that there's a lot of interest uh, amongst sort of popular science people in, in which of these companies is going to be the most successful if there's time. So with the flattery over, let's get on to the questions. So why don't we start by both of you guys just introducing yourselves and saying how you first got interested in studying fusion. Uh, thanks a lot for the flattery. So uh, my name is Justin Ball, and I'm a postdoc at the Swiss Plasma Center, where I study tokamaks and, in particular, theoretical aspects of turbulence. But um, I got uh, first interested in fusion when I was uh, 14 or 15. Um, I just had been reading about science and technology. I was always interested in math, and um, you know, climate change was first kind of coming on to uh, the popular seen in a big way. And so I was, you know, looking to see how I could contribute. And so I was interested in both fission and fusion. And I thought that most of the the issues with fission were public relations that, you know, I didn't think as a science geek, I could really do much about. Um, But I thought most of the problems with fusion were technical. And so I thought that was the the topic for me. Sure. Um, So I'm uh, also like uh, Justin, I'm a scientist. I'm a theoretical physicist at uh, the University of Oxford, and I'm doing my PhD in theoretical plasma physics. And uh, specifically, I'm looking at uh, plasma turbulence in the edge of fusion devices in a region called the plasma pedestal. So I used to uh, stare at the sun a lot when I was younger. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Very much so. dangerous game to play yeah i i used to have problems with my eyes because i used to do it a lot and i i went to the my, my uh my mother eventually got me to go to the doctor uh and uh the doctor basically told me uh you know the sun is a very you know bright incandescent object uh that would be very damaging to look at in the long term uh, and anyway from that uh i think she told me about fusion uh and i uh watched a a uh, program when I was about 16, it was on the BBC, and a uh, part of it was based at the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy, uh, which has the world's largest tokamak. It's just a few miles down the road. And I said, you know, gee, wouldn't it be awesome if one day I could be a um, physicist working on problems uh, related to this, or maybe even there? And now that's, uh, I guess that's come true. So, um, yep, that was, that was how I got into it. I thought that um, fusion is this kind of amazing at least being a a scientist in fusion it's this amazing blend of um working on problems which are really fun and interesting and um worthy in their own right as uh you know very very curious scientific questions but also as justin has alluded to um the practical implications are very obvious uh, and potentially quite immediate. So it, it, you know, it marries these two concepts of curiosity and practical utility quite nicely. Yeah, in some ways, it is the ultimate uh, physicist's energy source, I feel, because you have all of these wonderful problems that come out of uh, studying, even just studying plasma as a system, and the various ways that it can interact with itself and with the magnetic fields that are imposed on it. It's, uh, 
provides an incredibly complex and rich set of uh, dynamical behavior and things to look at. And yet you also have this, if you have this kind of long-term vision for the future of humanity and the future of uh, our energy use and so on, it's uh, it, it's a problem that really combines aspects of both of those that would sort of satisfy both a, a theoretician and a kind of grand thinker at the same time. So while you both talked about your research and uh the side of the theory and sort of the turbulence of things that you're looking at and uh, some of the theoretical problems, I guess, that still remain in understanding the behavior of plasma in tokamaks. And uh, my audience will already know a lot about tokamaks because we've been talking about the development of magnetic confinement fusion energy all the way from, uh, well, when it was first proposed in the sort of 40s and 50s, right the way through to tokamaks. Um, So what are the kind of outstanding physical problems that are still there in understanding and predicting uh, the behavior of plasma in tokamaks? And what sort of specifically are you guys researching in trying to reduce our uncertainties, I guess? So, I mean, the the primary physics problem that both Jason and I work on is, is turbulence. So this is like normal airplane turbulence. And so it, it jostles the particles around and allows them to escape from their magnetic bottle. Um, but this isn't normal neutral fu- fluid turbulence. This is uh, turbulence in a in a, a plasma. So you have the the nuclei which are positively charged and the electrons, and so turbulence in such a media actually causes turbulent electric and magnetic fields. Um, and then, in addition to this, the temperatures in these devices are so high that um, particle collisions are so rare that uh, you can't actually model it by a normal fluid. And so you actually have to keep track of the specific velocities and positions of the individual particles. And so this is, you know, a grand, turbulence is a grand challenge of physics, and this is a step beyond that. And so we, um, myself, I use uh, kinetic models that are run on big supercomputers to just directly model this turbulence. Um, my research in particular focuses on the effect of the plasma shape. So a tokamak is a, you know, donut-shaped object, and if you cut it in half and look at the cross-section, we think of donuts as being circular normally. But um, in the 1970s, it was discovered that by uh, using extra magnets to, to alter the shape of the plasma cross-section, so in particular to a, a capital D shape, um, that you could uh, reduce turbulence and improve the performance of tokamaks considerably. And so I work um, on seeing if there are shapes that are even better than uh, the D shape in order to, in order to reduce plasma turbulence as well as um, drive flows in the plasma that can have beneficial effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It it seems very interesting to me because we're in a world now where it almost seems like machine learning is a predominant uh, way of looking at things. And in in my research, I guess I'm a climate scientist, and we had a conference just the other day where we were trying to get lots and lots of machine learning people involved and helping solve our problems. And I suppose these all of these experiments, you know, JET, the the Vendelstein in the kind of stellarator arena, and the spherical tokamaks, which I guess are also looking at different plasma geometries and that kind of thing, they're all producing these huge amounts of data from which we might hope to infer behaviours uh, without necessarily understanding the underlying physical laws. Because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the problem with turbulence, especially in plasmas, is that there's no sort of closed form theory for how it's expected to behave. You know, there, there aren't some nice equations that we can write down and solve for each time step and figure out how the plasma is actually going to behave. And that's why you sort of end up having to uh, model on all of these different scales. And there's a very good bit in your book, actually, where you talk about the kind of hierarchy of plasma models and some some plasma models looking at, uh, I guess, bulk properties of the plasma and others trying to track individual particles so that you can get a decent representation of all the different things that are going on. Yeah, so I mean, the, the fundamental equations are, are well known. They just... I think as you would do, just completely impractical to solve on any sort of uh, human time scale, and so you have to go to reduced models. And um, these are, with the increase of computing power, you can you can solve these on on supercomputers. Uh, but every step of the process is a challenge, right? Writing these codes is really complicated. You have to figure out how to pair all of the the unnecessary physical effects out of your model so that you don't. Um, cause it to become too expensive, but then you still want an accurate answer. And so it's really very labor intensive because you have to run these codes, you have to make sure the output um, makes sense. And there's a lot of, a lot of details. 
yeah definitely sure um so my research basically um tries to understand uh well at, at the moment at least um a few things in the in the edge of a tokamak so uh every tokamak that or well, at least every medium to large size uh tokamak that is currently operating uh relies on a, an enhanced confinement regime uh called h mode so high performance mode uh and in each of these uh h modes there's a ubiquitous property which is called the pedestal so um as i'm sure you know one of the one of the kind of key aims for uh a fusion device is to have this thing called the triple product which is the density times the confinement time times the temperature uh you want that to be as large as possible in the in the core of your tokamak such that you can um you can have as high a power density or as high a fusion power uh as possible um and uh, one of the ways of getting that obviously is to have a high density and temperature uh in the center now um in the h mode it turns out that you can achieve a much higher uh density and temperature in the center um but the way that this is typically achieved is you have this region uh, in the edge whereby the um the uh the equilibrium temperature and uh density increase really quickly uh and it's called a pedestal uh and really kind of the the, the big outstanding question of the pedestal is what is the physical scale associated with this uh and what kind of physics causes it to have a length scale that it does uh and that's that's an open question um my current research is basically looking at um the theory of instabilities that lead to turbulence in the first place because you don't just get turbulence from nowhere you have to shake up um some kind of um density field or um you know electromagnetic field to, to get there um and i'm basically looking at these types of instabilities that are driven by um temperature gradients uh and we found some very interesting and curious things that happen in the pedestal um that get you uh f uh to have turbulence in the first place so it's called linear instability um so that's what i've been focusing on um at present yes and i suppose well maybe ultimately in the long term the aim of that kind of research would be because it always seems to me going through the history of fusion and i'm sure those faithful listeners who followed us thus far will be thinking plasma has a way of surprising the experimenters and doing things that they weren't expecting and that they couldn't quite uh, predict in advance um so you know there are all sorts of examples like there was a there was a brief era i guess in the 50s and 60s where people thought that the magnetic confinement fusion might even be doomed as an activity because the diffusion of these particles out appeared to just be too fast to have a practical working reactor and then they found that you know if you pass a current through the thing and build a more tokamak style design you have better confinement and then you know there's all sorts of cases for the laser confinement fusion where uh, scientists had uh, computer simulations and code that really told them that this uh, this next experiment would be the one that would achieve uh, you know ignition and certain properties in the plasma and then it, it turned out that there were more instabilities than were previously expected and so it almost seems like each new generation of machines uh, and experimenters is is moving further and further into unexplored uh, i guess uh, parameter space unexplored conditions for the plasma to exist in and they keep finding new things and i think one of the primary concerns for someone who's listened to this story over and over again would be thinking well when we switch on this next reactor the eta reactor um how is it that we know that we're not going to run into some new unexpected property in the same way as something like the H mode that you were talking about was actually discovered by accident and no one really knew that it was going to be there? Um, I mean, do you think that we're getting to a stage where we can uh, better predict how the plasma in something like ETA will behave or are there still the potential for uh, surprises when it actually gets there? I mean, there's there's definitely potential for surprises. Um, like you said, uh, it's... Uh... There's been a lot of surprises thus far. We definitely, you know, we know more than we ever mm -hmm. have in the past. We have these first principle models that we're now finally able to run on computers. But at the end of the day, ITER is a science experiment. And so we can do a lot of analysis. We can extrapolate from current experiments. And um, that's led to the design of ITER. But ultimately, yeah, there is, there is uncertainty. Um, and it, it goes both ways. So, you know, there's new plasma instabilities. But, you know, there's things like H mode. There's also um, the discovery of a spontaneous current that can be driven into the plasma. And so from time to time, Mother Nature does 
say to, to cut us <laughs> some slack and and uh, give us some help. Yes, that's true. It's not always bad. Um, what this spontaneous current that's driven in the plasma? Do you want to talk a bit more about that? I'm um, sure. Yeah, it's it's called the the bootstrap current, um, and it's it w- it wasn't discovered until you know 20 or 30 years after fusion research started. So, uh, understandably, it's quite technical and convoluted. Um, but what but the bottom line is um, the plasma. The, the motion of particles in the plasma spontaneously cause an electric current to, to arise. And so for tokamaks, this is really good because you need to drive a current in the plasma um, to, to create stability. Also, confinement improves with, with the uh, current in the plasma, but it's, it's really expensive and difficult in practice to drive this current in steady state. And so uh, pl- plasma theoreticians in the US and in Russia um, doing pencil and paper math um, predicted the existence of the spontaneous current. And then, you know, 10 years or so later, it was observed in devices. And it it has to do with the fact that the temperatures um, and density vary throughout the device. And so what that means is that if you, if you have really flexible heating schemes as well as flexible fueling schemes, you can control the way that the density and temperature of the plasma vary in order to maximize this. And so, um, for, for example, in really aggressive power plant designs, they'll um, postulate very specific density and temperature profiles in order to create a really large bootstrap current. And then that um, improves the performance of the power plant because you don't need to spend much energy to, uh, to drive the current. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, what you're improving um, there is almost like a, the, the engineering ratio of the total power in that's required to generate any fusion power at all versus the actual fusion power that you're getting out. And you're doing that not by necessarily increasing the fusion power, but I guess by making your plant more efficient. Exactly, yeah. So you're effectively uh, meaning you can create the plasma current that you need with less um, input electricity. And then hence you have more electricity to sell to potential consumers. Yeah, it's this, um, it's this pretty amazing example of a calculation that is quite complicated. And as Justin mentioned, it's like pretty amazing that both the Soviets and the Americans came up with it, I think, within one or two years of each other. Uh, but So it's something that's very abstract that actually has uh, a very important role in like the economics of fusion or the engineering of fusion. And I'm not sure, um, you know, if we didn't have people doing this theory... I expect it would exist to some extent, but I don't think they could have optimized plants anywhere near as well to have um, you know, the bootstrap fraction that they currently they currently have nowadays. Mm-hmm. So that's a fair real pushback to the perspective of the development of fusion energy that I was sort of giving before, because I was saying, oh, the experimenters, you know, there's a, there's a, a, an interesting conflict, I guess, more generally, not necessarily conflict, but certainly contrast in physics between experimenters and theoreticians. And in some fields, <laughs> yep, conflict, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> exactly. But in in some in some fields, the experimenters are far off ahead of the theoreticians, and uh, they're creating things that the theoreticians are then required to somehow explain. And then sometimes, at some parts of history for other fields, uh, the the theoreticians uh, have their theoretical models. Um, and you know, to test it, it's like, oh, we have this model, but to test it, you need to build the Large Hadron Collider just to make sure that the Higgs is where we say it is. You know, so it's. Uh, I guess the field of fusion energy is quite interesting in that advances at different stages have been made by both uh, camps. Yeah, t- to be honest, though, though it pains me to say this, <clears throat> um, experiments definitely do um, most of the time lead theory, but every so often, every so often, um, theory breaks through. Well, I mean, one of the main one of the main reasons that uh, ETA is so large, right, is just the theory of um, uh, what the, or I would say probably more simulations of um, of plasma turbulence, right, and that you kind of come up with an estimate for how long you want your um, confinement time to be. And um, we basically said, look, we can't get good enough confinement, so we're making the device a lot bigger. Would you agree with that, Justin? Or... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the there's been a lot of analysis that that went into the EJA design. So definitely, turbulent simulations um, were used. On the other hand, empirical scaling laws, which are basically the exact opposite of these really sophisticated um, turbulent simulations. So for empirical scaling laws, you basically 
uh, put all of your data from all of your experiments and um, try to draw a statistical um, line that goes straight through all the data and best fits it. And then, so there's no physics work involved, nothing, no physics insight. You just use pure data analysis to try to predict uh, the behavior. And so I think that was very important for the eater design as well. Yes, yeah, so you're just making observations and looking for uh, a sort of functional dependence, like, oh, it turns out that the temperature goes as B squared and that kind of thing. But these, uh, these yep. scaling laws, um, so you think they were quite influential in the design of ETA. I'm remembering there's a wonderful part in your book where you actually explain the question that I'm sure has been on the minds of many uh, people on funding bodies and Congress people and so on throughout the years is, why do your devices have to keep getting bigger? Uh, yeah, so the, the general intuition behind it is uh, this um, surface area to volume ratio scaling. So if you imagine just having a, a sphere of fuel, um, the volume of the sphere is proportional to the radius cubed while the surface area is only proportional to the radius squared. So basically, if you make the device bigger, you're increasing the volume in which fusion can happen relative to the surface area uh, through which heat can leak out. So there's this kind of intrinsic um, uh, geometrical fact that bigger bigger plasmas will have better confinement. And Just so like that's... Person stays warmer in the winter, right? Yeah, exactly. And so that's why fusion devices... Uh, seeking better performance have gotten bigger. So you can think there's, there's two ways to improve the performance. You can take the, the expensive but straightforward way of making it bigger, or you can try to be clever with things like H mode and plasma shaping and things like that. Um, but ultimately, for either to get its performance, it needs to go to big size, as well as improve, uh, including clever physics tricks. One thing that's quite interesting about these empirical scaling laws that have uh, been derived and have shown up just by looking at the outputs of lots of different tokamaks so far is that actually they also provide an opportunity to build smaller devices with stronger magnetic fields as a kind of alternative route to fusion and i guess that's more or less what uh, the people out of um, commonwealth fusion systems and the sort of mit spin out companies and things are trying to do with their devices so um would you like to talk a little bit about just that specific approach towards fusion? And then we can talk a little more about some of the other um, fusion startups later after I've asked you a bit more about the book. Uh, sure, yeah. So I was um, involved in the, the original um, ARC design, which um, was a, a power plant design that came out of MIT and kind of formed uh, the starting point for the, for the company. And so I'm really excited about... Uh, Commonwealth in particular and, and prospects for it going forwards. Uh, but what, you, what you're discussing is basically these scaling laws as well as um, you know, plasma theory and simulations all suggest that higher magnetic field helps in a lot of ways. So you know, you're trying to make uh, a magnetic cage to confine your particles. And so if your magnetic cage is stronger, um, then uh, the cage gets better, the, the performance improves. And there's, there's this uh, trade-off where um, if you want to get better performance, you can go to higher sizes or you can go to strong magnetic fields. And until recently, basically the, the magnetic field was limited by technological constraints related to the, the superconducting material that's used to make the magnets to generate the field. Um, but in, in 1983, a new, new class of superconductors called high temperature superconductors were discovered. And since then, there's been this kind of gradual incremental technological development of people figuring out how these materials work, which ones are, are uh, viable, um, you know, which ones you can grow into, into large crystals and then make cables out of. And so you know, over the last 30 years, um, this process, which is entirely independent of fusion, has reached technological maturity and are starting to produce something that can uh, make a marketable product and that we can buy and, and make magnets out of. And so this has the potential to really change what a tokamak power plant would look like. Um, you can potentially make it much smaller and that has a bunch of knock-on effects where if you can make your plant smaller, then instead of having to d design a big uh, expensive power plant, uh, sorry, a big expensive experiment to test an idea, you could do something smaller on a shorter time scale and, and iterate through faster. Um, 
the big open question, though, that, that Commonwealth is trying to answer is um, how strong of a magnetic field can you go to? Um, so people have, have used this high temperature superconductor to, to build a small like you know, tabletop magnet and generate two or three times the magnetic field um, that we currently use. But the question is, when you're trying to build a huge magnetic coil for a tokamak that's several meters, um, it's a lot more challenging. And so what's unclear is, is uh, how much benefit um, it's possible to achieve through this. I think a few things I would add to that is that um, Commonwealth, I, I mean, as Justin has said, increasing the magnetic field is, is good for a very wide range of um, like power plant properties. But um, Commonwealth and other startups that are uh, pursuing this idea, they could almost be too, uh, too successful for their own good because as you increase the magnetic field, um, but you're in a smaller device, the, uh, the power exhaust, so the, the amount of um, diverter heating that you're going to get could be very, very, very large. Um, so the, you know, the kind of um, requirements that are placed on materials increases a lot. I think also things like disruptions um, have been shown to be uh, a little bit more dangerous when you have a higher, um, higher magnetic field. Um, so in some ways, uh, having a stronger magnetic field is very, very good, but it places the onus on other technologies that you have to get right. Um, for example, the materials on the wall uh, and your disruption mitigation system. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is if you have, if, you, if say Commonwealth is successful in building a small, compact, high field device, and you also build ITER, then you can, you can compare and contrast the two, right? So Jason is talking about potential limitations related to heat exhaust. Um, ITER has a very different parameter set, and you, know, you can discover uh, different pros and cons from the two different approaches. But the important thing is they're not mutually exclusive. And so you can... Um, come up with some combination of the two, a large, um, higher magnetic field device and figure out the optimal combination and, and what ultimately leads to the best power plant. Yeah, there's loads of great threads to pick up on here. I think th this this question that has really started to come to the fore a little bit more as we're getting further and further down the fusion road is this question of, okay, you might be able to reach ignition or you might be able to get a, a plasma where you're producing more energy uh, than is required to heat it and maintain it. But there's a whole bunch of other properties that your power plant needs to have if you're actually going to be able to harness that power in a useful way. And I guess ITER, the big tokamak in the south of France that's being built, and Commonwealth Fusion Systems' device, um, is that called Spark at this point? That's right, isn't it? Yeah, so the original um, design is Spark, or is Arc, and then the first device that they want to build as a proof of principle of, of high field technology is, is called Spark, which is basically smallest possible arc. <laughs> it's a nice optimistic superlative title. Yeah. So it's these two approaches, one where you have the largest, uh, a very, you know, the largest possible device to build before your funding runs out <laughs> and a slightly lower, uh, perhaps more reliable set of uh, magnets. And the other one is where you're going to much higher magnetic fields with a much smaller device. One of the questions that interests me is this question of disruptions. So we should say that disruptions are these events that happen every so often in tokamaks. Um, and as I understand it, well, why don't you guys explain disruptions? I'm sure, yeah. So this is uh, basically a, a dramatic, uncontrolled loss of, of plasma stability. And so there can be a number of reasons for it. Um, so in, for instance, if you you know try to confine too much um, plasma. So if you accidentally inject too, uh, too much fueling, then uh, basically the, the power of the plasma, the, the strength of the plasma will overwhelm the strength of the magnetic field and just writhe out of control and, and hit your first wall. And then it cools down. Um, there can also be, you know, if you, if one of your magnets shorts out or your control system has a glitch in it, um, so all these things cause the plasma to go unstable. Ultimately, the, the drive for the instability is the plasma current. And so that's why it's, uh, it's something that's, that's fairly unique to tokamaks. Of you have this enormous plasma current needed for stability. And um, if you don't make it behave, then it um, you know, runs wild and, and can potentially damage um, surrounding components like your first wall or you know, antenna or any sort of diagnostics you have. 
Mm -hmm. And there was a case reported, I think, at the Jet uh, Topamac in Cullum, where there was one particularly violent disruption and the whole device jumped some centimetres up into the air or something along those lines. Yep. I imagine there must have been quite the large bang associated with that as well. <laughs> it's not not exactly what you want to hear when you run your pulse through. Um, so when it comes to ETA, I mean, one thing that's really fascinating is just this idea of, well, if disruptions are a common feature, um, I know people have ways that they're trying to mitigate them, but could it, could it be almost something that um, if it turns out that these disruptions become more common when you're reaching ETA's parameter space, or the same is true, as you say, with Commonwealth fusion systems, where you have a much smaller uh, spark device with higher magnetic fields, then, you know, would that be sufficient to really scupper it ever functioning as a, as a decent power plant? Or, or do you think we'll just need to find better ways of preventing them from happening and also predicting when they're going to happen? Because, you know, saying it, it arises when the plasma current is disrupted is one thing, but it, there's, I, I am, imagine that there's all kinds of weird and wonderful ways that plasma can behave that will cause that sort of disruption to occur without us necessarily being able to predict it that far in advance? Well, I, I think, yeah, the problem is, is that typically the uh, the um, negative impacts of the disruption or the damage done um, scales very badly with the size of the device. So we do, you, we do um, quite frequently on modern devices get kind of smaller scale disruptions. Um, I think the bigger ones tend to be controlled, but smaller ones do happen and it's, it's not a complete showstopper for the device, but um, larger devices like a power plant size device, um, some uh, the way that they've currently been engineered, they could possibly only withstand a few disruptions before you have to completely replace um, lots of the, uh, you know, like the vacuum vessel surrounding it and lots of the components. Um, so I think um, Justin and I were discussing this last night. I think probably one of the, uh, the better ways to deal with it is instead of um, having these, very complex um well obviously you want to have a you want to have a, a disruption mitigation system that says you know um i'm able to predict these types of disruptions and um you know if i'm able to predict it in time then i i do something such as sending a shattered pellet into the device to do that that's all very well and good but uh, as you also said um ether i mean ether in its plasma volume is going to be uh, 10 times bigger than anything we've ever built before so there could be a whole class of new instabilities that we don't actually know about so a preferable thing is to is to engineer the device to be more robust uh, to be able to withstand these disruptions um, and if something really bad does happen to be able to quickly and cheaply just put in a new vacuum vessel uh, instead of having the whole thing um, offline for a year or so mm -hmm. because if we're talking about i mean I don't know exactly how common these disruptions are. I tried to look up some statistics for JET, which is the biggest current tokamak running. And it seems like maybe 10% of every time they run it, they get a disruption. Does that sound fair? Uh, so in experiments, it's very common. So like I've been involved with um, some experiments recently and probably at least half of, half of the plasma discharges end up in a disruption. But the important and how does that feel? Is there a general groan around the room when you realize what's happened? Uh, I mean, see, so like in experiments, you're trying something new, right? And so yes, I'm course. using plasma shapes that have never been done before. And there's, you know, lots of new things. And it's the consequences of it aren't very large. And so we're pushing the device to its limit. Um, mm -hmm. you now, if, if it's not disrupting, then, then uh, you know, you could be getting better performance out of the device. And so this is, this is, uh, an important thing for a power plant of people have done statistical analyses of disruptions and the best way to avoid a disruption is to operate with very modest plasma conditions and so if you don't if you're not aggressive if you don't push the density you don't push the temperature you make sure you have a, a nice strong uh, margin on a lot of your safety limits then um, you can avoid plasma disruptions to a much greater degree uh, and so there's you know Ultimately, it's a it's a trade off of how aggressive you need to be to make the economics of your plant good enough. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I suppose you'd almost need, if if you're imagining a car, you might need a car with a top speed of two hundred miles an hour, and then just run it in third gear the whole time. Um, you'd have to build something that is capable of uh, with withstanding or operating in a much a, a much wider parameter space than the sort of parameter space where you're plant itself will be profitable. Does that sound fair? 
Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think uh, Jason also made a, a good point of designing your system to, um, in the worst case of a disruption, to be able to rebound um, pretty quickly. So you design your first wall such that you can replace it pretty easily. Because uh, at the end of the day, disruptions do happen. And even if, you know, um, you can never be 100% sure, basically. Uh, and so if if you design your system such that it's not a disaster, then maybe you can operate more aggressively and just say, okay, once in a blue moon, a disruption might happen, but, uh, you know, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're imagining operating a power plant, you know, it, it, it's it's almost death to a power plant if you have any kind of uh, possibility that the power plant goes out of commission for, you know, if it's out of commission half the time that it's supposed to be operating, for example, then your profit margin is cut in half straight away. And, well, not even your profit margin, your, you know, um, the amount of power you're producing. Yeah, so yeah. Everything, yeah. I mean, ha half the time would definitely be uh, intolerable. And yeah. If you look at, for example, I mean, it is obviously the first, kind of almost reactor sized device tokamak that has been built and if you look at the order in which they have to build things you can't it's not just you know bring all the pieces together and put it in the order that you think is is uh you know fastest there's a very specific order in which you do things um and the problem is is that you know what if something breaks because of a disruption that you put in you know really really early on and you have to take everything out before you can replace that part um so there's also, I mean, just a big engineering challenge of, of building robust, resilient devices that can be um, rapidly changed out with new parts in case something happens. Yeah, this almost reminds me of one of my favorite stories from the history of fusion, which is this penthouse fusion project where by, funded by Bob Guccione, who was the head of uh, penthouse magazine and he owned this magazine Omni where they had science interviews and things back in the day. And he interviewed this uh, kind of disgruntled fusion scientist who was annoyed that the government wouldn't fund his projects. And his idea was basically for a modular tokamak, like a very small tokamak, where instead of worrying about the uh, conditions and the irradiation of the vacuum vessel and all this kind of thing, you would just replace it very frequently, like burning out a light bulb and replacing it over and over again. And by that way, he hoped, I guess, to avoid some of these... Uh, I guess, materials and engineering issues with creating the tokamak and have a much smaller device. I think ultimately it, it wouldn't have worked and he did go on to work on polywells and things like this. But uh, it, it, maybe some of these ideas are sort of ripe for revival now. But with something like ITER, it's so difficult to imagine how they could do that. I mean, let, let's let's talk about some of the material sciences challenges involved in ITER, like even finding the appropriate materials for things like the first wall, which has to absorb the brunt of these disruptions and plasma discharges and and the diverter which is really what is supposed to channel the heat energy i guess uh, towards where it can be harnessed i mean even working out appropriate materials to build these things out of is a huge scientific challenge in itself uh yeah definitely we we agree um there's there's in in a lot of fusion there's trade-offs and so um materials is definitely a really important issue um and uh, you know, it's either is right on the limit of of what current technology can do, and it's really pushing current technology. Um, but looking forward, you know, if if you make progress with plasma physics, then you can design your system such that the mirror the the um, material science issues are more tolerable. Um, and so, there's it, ultimately it is a big engineering optimization effort. Um, where you can make progress on, on many fronts. Um, but yeah, the material science, I think it, it's a good point. It is, it is definitely a challenge. And just to give you, I mean, just to give you a number, uh, the, it's estimated that the, um, the steady state heat flux on the uh, ITER diverter will be about 10, uh, 10 megawatts per square meter. Um, and the, yeah, the steady state um, heat flux on the, uh, the shuttle upon re-entry was about like three or four, three or four megawatts. So the material, you're already at the limit of what current materials can do. It's kind of crazy. Yes, yeah, so you need a heat shield that's more than, well, a heat diverter that's more than twice as effective as the one that's used in the space shuttle. And I think we should also say, just for the sake of uh, pointing it out, that 
the temperatures required in something like ITER or, or a device uh, like Spark or any any fusion reactor really are substantially higher than those that you find in the sun. Yeah. Yep. About ten times. Yeah. And how much more dense is it uh, in uh, in the centre of ITER than the sun? Uh, Sorry, no. The the sun is a whole lot more, more dense, dense than it is. It's it's a uh, it's a lot. It's, it's yeah. Similar. Lower temperature. Yeah. yeah. So we're 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 operating almost. We're trying to not just get experimental data, but actually get power out of uh, some extremely extreme conditions that you don't see uh, so, on Earth very often. Just one one more point about the the material problem. Um, I think. So, so one of the examples of a, of a plasma physics solution to to the the material science issue is that's being explored, you know, really aggressively right now is the the concept of what's called detachment. Of basically, you have a layer of neutral gas that's actually shielding the solid diverter, um, and so the the plasma comes down. It inter, it's intercepted by this neutral gas. Mm -hmm. which then radiates the energy um, evenly over a, a much larger area and then um, makes the, the, the material challenges a lot more, a lot more easily obtainable. Um, so in some ways, it's a little bit like introducing an impurity. I guess when we've talked about some plasma experiments in the past, whenever you have atoms in your plasma that have electrons, uh, they act as very good radiators to radiate away all of the energy that's stored by the plasma because the electrons can be excited into higher energy states and then they can de-excite and release these photons as radiation. So uh, it's that sort of approach, I guess, to cooling down the diverter and reducing the flux on it. But if, if you did that, I mean, you, you call it a plasma physics solution to a material science problem. How do you then ensure that that neutral gas doesn't end up being mixed with the plasma and changing its behavior in some way? That's exactly the problem. So, <laughs> so generally in current devices, you can get detachment, and so you get this layer of neutral atoms, and so the plasma hits it, and you know your your diverter sees uh, much lower heat heat loads, but then your neutral um, layer expands and works its way back up, and then gets to your main plasma, and then causes your main plasma to cool down. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, there's um, there's an experiment that was uh, recently completed. So uh, the the mast U, the mast upgrade. Uh, project at Cullum in the UK. So this um, is a spherical tokamak that's uh, yep, this... smaller than jet, but with different uh, kind of size of its core, I guess. Exactly. And then also the, the device here at the Swiss Plasma Center, uh, TCV, is also working on this. But basically by um, having kind of an isolated chamber that's um, further removed from your, uh, from your plasma, you can potentially uh, halt the the progress of this this layer of neutral gas, so you can you can uh, achieve stable detachment, and this is basically by having uh, solid material barriers that prevent the neutral atoms from um, having a direct line of sight onto the main plasma. And so you can reduce the heat flux on the diverter and then avoid it from melting that way, I guess. Yeah, because and the you... concern is, I mean, these temperatures are higher than temperatures at which any sort of known material will just melt and vaporize like tungsten has a melting point that's you know thousands of kelvin or whatever and it's just nowhere near the kind of temperatures that they're going to have to put up with yep and if you kind of see a a trend of there are problems in fusion and then we're researching uh potential solutions that generally add technical complexity and or cost um but basically if you if you figure out uh, if you make advancements in enough of these areas, and so say we figure out an easy way to achieve stable detachment without um, requiring extra coils, without requiring a whole bunch of additional expense, then we can use that as leverage in order to uh, make the whole device the whole device better. And so then maybe um, since heat exhaust isn't, a much, isn't as much of a problem, that allows you to get a higher magnetic field and then confinement um, isn't as much of an issue. So you're in this kind of amazing situation, actually, where the complexity of the problem is a reason for confidence, not actually um, for concern. Yeah, I really love this uh, brand of thinking that comes across very clearly in the book, that actually, because developing a fusion reactor requires advancements across so many different fields, you feel like there's never going to be a standstill because 
if one of those fields isn't advancing, others will, and they will all free up uh, different ways that you can configure your reactors and try to build it in a slightly different way. I'm, I'm going to have to be the real kind of devil's advocate here. So an episode we have coming up is called the Buzzkill episode, uh, in which I play devil's advocate and advance all of the counter arguments against fusion energy becoming a, uh, a practical reality, or at least on any sort of near term time scale. And chief amongst these are the kind of economics of fusion. So if you have to build big power plants like ITER, it might prove difficult or even impossible to get the proper financing in place. And I think we're, all, we're seeing this all across the fishing industry, especially in this country where, you know, the, they were supposed to build an, another four huge sort of gigawatt style uh, power plants, um, gigawatt scale power plants. Uh, Toshiba have pulled out of their one in Wolfer and there's Hinkley C, which is this kind of dragging out behemoth that may or may not ever be finished. I think well, it probably will be finished, but it will certainly then provide some of the most expensive uh, electricity um, out there. So given these sort of economic concerns, how do you f- how do you see fusion becoming competitive? And if you don't think it will be competitive with the cheapest energy sources, what is its role going to be? Well, I, I mean, there, there are lots of ways to tackle this this. Question. I, I guess the first thing that really needs to be said is we just don't know what the economics uh, of a fusion plant are going to be like. I mean, we, 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 we know the general, at least we think we understand what the general size will be, um, et cetera, et cetera. But until you've actually built one, um, you don't, I think, it, I think it's hard to know precisely like how long it's going to take, how hard it's going to be in terms of financing and, and, and regulatory regulatory environment. Um, also, you know, um, I mean, I don't think anyone's claiming that we're going to have widespread fusion by 2030. Um, but, you know, maybe if, if it's 2050, 2060, um, there, there, it's probably likely that there'll be some kind of price on carbon or something that, um, you know, really um, emphasizes low carbon sources. And if you take all that into account, you might see that fusion is actually um, a lot more competitive than it is on, you know, on a free market where um, costs aren't externalized. And then I guess in addition to that, but you are, you are right that, uh, and Justin knows more about this than, than I do. So correct me if I'm wrong here, Justin, but a large portion of um, the capital costs for a, uh, for a fission plant and capital costs are the main costs um, are actually financing uh, costs or just, just interest. Um, well, I wonder if you're familiar with this argument that's by sort of Maori Markovitz, which uh, I came across uh, that he writes about, which is essentially saying that although part of the problems with fusion reactors are going to end up being in the final analysis, even if something like ITER works or even if something like Spark works and you can actually get energy out of a much smaller device, um, you you run into all of these issues with if you're financing something that takes... 10 years to build or 20 years to build and requires a large overhead at the start and also uses new technology that hasn't necessarily been proven yet it gives you a, an an economic hump on top of the technological and scientific hump towards uh, being adopted and if you're trying to get as you say the finances in place the bankers will look at it and they'll say well hang on a minute all i care about is getting profit out fairly quickly and so I might not want to fund a device that takes 10 years to construct or even five years to construct and has a big overhead cost. If I could just fund lots of smaller devices like uh, renewable fission, uh, not renewable fission, sorry, uh, solar plants and wind farms and so on, um, which will start realizing a profit on a shorter time scale. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's just this is why I think you're seeing in a lot of cases, even for fission power plants, which at this stage should be a much more mature technology than they are now. You know, they've been working for 50, 60 years and some countries like France are almost entirely get all of their electricity from this source. So, you know, they, they, they've been, they've had that uh, time to mature as a technology, but even they are relying quite heavily on, uh, on government subsidies and government things to build them because private companies uh, aren't so keen on, well, initially the overhead costs and then also the costs for decommissioning and insurance and all this sort of thing that they have to worry about. 
So I, I think it's really interesting what you said about um, that fission technology should be mature, right? Because we've had it since you know the 50s. Um, but because because of these the large device size and also the the regulatory environment of people are very concerned about safety of fission plants. So I, I worked in a, a fission plant for a summer, and you know if you want to you know change the type of screw that's used for such and such form signed in triplicate exactly, and so it really it really makes um, iteration on design very difficult and very lengthy. And the fact that in the U.S. you haven't had really almost any plants built since the 1970s mean that I'm not really sure that it, fission is uh, incredibly mature technology. And I'm sure that there would be ways to build plants that are better um, than they're doing now. The sort of thorium fast breeder concepts you hear people talk about, I don't know too much about them, but I do know that there's other yeah, designs so that people would like to uh, have a go of experimenting with in the fission set. And now, and, and, you know, solar cell and renewable is the exact opposite where you can build something on, on a, on a tabletop and iterate through, you know, hundreds of times to make the most efficient solar cell possible. And so for fusion, it is really important. I agree. And it would be great if we could have smaller device sizes. And then the other really important thing that um, isn't talked a lot about, but um, if fusion is to become a practical power source, is I think crucial is the regulatory environment in which fusion is put. So fusion is seen as the exact same as fission, and you know radiation is bad, and everything needs to be, like you said, signed in triplicate. Then it's going to to stifle progress in fusion. On the other hand, if it's recognized that you know fusion has um, you know orders of magnitude less radioactive material on site, is just inherently can't have meltdowns, um, you know, if, if governments recognize the nuance between fission and fusion, then fusion potentially um, has a leg up over fission. There, it, there might well be the argument that it does need, if, it, if it's going to be a, a long uh, time scale thing to build, it might need substantial government support to begin with. But I mean, that's been the case for uh, you know, for the commercial on the commercial side, that's been the case for many technologies. Oh, um, and I also think maybe I, I don't know exactly how this will work, but um, if fusion plants become extremely standardized, you know, those kind of things could make it a lot easier for them to get um, approved quickly uh, and and built quickly as well. Um, you know, I I, th I think a lot of it just depends on the details of what what we see at the time. Um, but as Justin said, if you could have smaller devices that are built uh, a lot faster uh, and um, you know have a lot less risk associated with them then that that would be a really huge boon as well thank you for listening to this episode of physical attraction my guests were justin ball and jason parisi if you'd like to find out more please do get their book the future of fusion energy which is both a highly entertaining and highly informative read they also both have websites in the same format justin-ball.com and jason-parisi.com and they can both be found on Twitter if you're into that sort of thing. Remember, comments, questions, concerns, feedback, etc. can all be directed to me on Twitter at PhysicsPod or via the contact form on our website at www.physicspodcast.com. It's always so wonderful to hear from listeners, and this is your chance to help me make the show as good as it can be. You can also help us out by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts, purchasing past bonus episodes from the website or leaving a donation via the PayPal form on the website, or just telling as many people as possible about the show to help spread the word if you like what we do. Until next time then, take care. Thank you.